So, today's topic, Scale Without NoSQL. Uh, you'll quickly learn that that title is a bit misleading, so uh, I don't want to give away too much yet. All right, uh, since I'm here, I got to promo our company a little bit. So, <laughs> excuse the advertising. Uh, so we build an audio version of Twitter. It's got a mobile app, and then in many countries like Indonesia, India, it also has a call-in service. So, social networking, group messaging, what you expect in a social network. So, the last line is the reason we're here. The traffic growth has caused us to make some changes. Um, this is the last side about Bubbly. Don't worry, we'll get to tech soon. Uh, so, we're all over Asia, headquarters in many, many different countries. All the, uh, all these other locations are that's not engineering that's inter interopping with um, telcos. You can see we have some good investors. And then the important line for today's talk is the user line, the total count there. 30 million plus, that's what causes us to get to a level of scale where the problems get more interesting. Okay. Uh, and since we're at Microsoft, I'm going to call it one of our board members, Tony Bates, who I believe is now a Microsoft employee, no longer the CEO of Skype. Uh, and he is on the list to replace Ballmer, FYI. We're rooting for him since he's on our board. Okay. Now we're getting to the tech. This is what we have. You can see uh, all these boxes in red are things that are coming from Amazon. We don't build them, we're just connecting the dots, all right? That little part in purple, well, we have a guest apparently who is from Play, so he will recognize that. That's using Scala. We're not gonna talk about Scala or Play in this talk. We're actually only focusing on that little section right there where it says RDS, which is Amazon's renaming of SQL. So that is just a database. Uh, the reddest box is where you realize I'm lying a little bit and we actually do use NoSQL, so we'll get to that. Oh, and RR, Ruby on Rails, I'm not talking about that either today. So that's all the stuff we're not talking about. Okay, so this is the justification of why we might actually know something worth sharing. So, with 30 plus million users, it's connected in a social graph, so you have your follow table. Who you're following, who's following you, right? That's your Facebook, your Twitter, everybody has that now. So within that, we send messages one to many, which is Twitter, and we send them one to one, okay? So you can see the, what kind of traffic you're going to get. To make it a little more interesting, we also send messages from a smartphone through our network down into a feature phone. So that creates some interesting communication challenges. All right? Uh, like I said, I was lying. Um, Specifically, when I said scale without NoSQL, what I was really trying to get to is the point that um, lack of my own personal trust in the ability for a lot of the NoSQL solutions to store your data without losing anything ever under any sort of scaling situations. So yes, we use Redis. It's fantastic. It massively reduces the number of SQL cores that we have to end up running. But it's a read cache. I can go in a Redis server, wipe it, everything recovers fine. You wouldn't even notice. Okay? It's only for performance in our model. Um, it also means that, let's say we need to pull up a new Redis server, and something goes wrong with Redis clustering, it doesn't really matter. We can just wipe it, start over, and there's no downtime. All right? So we use it to solve certain performance problems, but we're not relying on it. Um, NoSQL is a very, very broad term, so I'm sure that someone can point out a mistake in this chart. I'll try and... I'm being a li little broad in some of the definitions. Okay, so this is the no versus yes SQL. First line, ACID. Uh, ACID is I'm running a bank and I want to make sure that the, I, I don't give a customer too much money. Right? So you want to do atomic changes to a database and you guarantee that no, either it will completely fail or it will completely succeed. There's no middle ground, right? I won't increment your bank account's dot bonds by a dollar and forget to subtract the dollar from somebody else's bank account. That's ACID. It's great for banks. Um, turns out in many, 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 many real world situations, you don't need to be that accurate, right? If, say, I friend somebody on Facebook and God forbid, forbid in like 0.001% of the situations, I friend them, but the friend, does, friend relationship doesn't come back, everything still, go, still works. The, the world goes on, nobody lost a million dollars, it's not that bad. So 
you can gain enormous performance advantages by dropping that, su that, that support for acid. So that's what a lot of people do. That's where a lot of the perf gains that you get searching from SQL Server to MongoDB come from. Okay? Horizontal scaling is the key value that I see in most of the NoSQL solutions. It's also the part I'm most nervous about and why I'm not relying on. Um, when you use, say, Mongo, you specify how to, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit, how to, how to pick from your key which server to go to, sharding, okay? Uh, Redis has a similar logic. You need, for Mongo, you have to specify your algorithm. For Redis, it uses a simple hash function. There's a lot of different techniques. And the interesting part is, when you add a new server to that, how does it know which server to go to to get the data? All right? And normally, when it divides this data across multiple servers, when you add, say, you go from two servers to three servers, it has to move some of the data from those other two servers over to the third server. And what happens while that data is being moved along? All right, what happens if something goes down? What if you have a network failure? How does it do that? All right? And unless that is 100% reliable, you will lose data. So that's why I'm nervous. SQL, on the other hand, doesn't do anything for you, particularly useful. So you're on your own, which means you control the algorithm and you can make it as safe or as terrible as you want. Um, I'll go into some of the approaches for dealing with this, ones that we're using and ones I've seen from other companies. Um, the data store, obviously this is not universally true, but it's very common in the NoSQL world that it's key value versus SQL, which tries to do everything with the relational model. Okay. Uh, the key value model has a huge advantage, which is seen in the next line, which is there is no schema, so I want to add a new column, I'm sorry, a new, and yeah, a new column. That's just adding an extra field in this little JSON data structure and inserting it, all right? Whereas in SQL, that's alter table. And as soon as you have a table with 10 million rows, alter table is really, really bad. That's downtime, okay? Uh, AWS setup. Uh, I assume anybody who's trying to do a startup is going to be looking at AWS or a similar one. AWS does give you DynamoDB, which it is supposedly functionally equivalent to Dynamo, but it's its own custom tag. Anyway, uh, it works. A, it's a key value store hash table, so they have that. So I'm not going to say that nothing. The other solutions are all um, like third-party provided EC2 instances you can pull up. Mongo has one from Tengen. Uh, but their support for databases is very, very strong, very built in. You just go check a box, say I want a database, I want it to be this power, and I want to guarantee this amount of IO bandwidth, and I want to read clone. It's like five check boxes and you're done. Incredibly easy to set up. So it's very, since it's such an established technology, a lot of the basic operations are very well um, managed and maintained by these existing AWS or other cloud infrastructures. So we'll break them down one by one, my points. Uh, horizontal scaling, like I said, it's the ability to add another server into your data store. So there's one example here. Obviously you can see from the URL that it's from 2010. Uh, and if you go and ask the Tengen guys, they'll explain how everything in there has been fixed and it's, you know, will never happen again. The point is not that this particular error will ever hit you, which is one Foursquare hit and ended up with about, I think it was 11 hours of downtime. It's more that these things are new, and Foursquare is a very, very smart company with some amazing engineers. Then they thought they knew how to scale. And these guys are not stupid. Like They did their planning. And when it actually came to an, an event where they had to scale, it didn't go as well as they were expecting. So it's OK to assume, I guess, that you're smarter than the Foursquare guys. But I'm not saying that about myself. So. I'm not, I'm not willing to, to make assumptions on a design based on that, okay? So what do you do when you're using SQL? SQL is great. You have to spend a whole bunch of time asking yourself questions. So how easy it is in your database model to take one of your tables and move it to a separate database, right? How many foreign key constraints did you put in, right? If you move the table from one database to another, you're going to break all those. So you're going to have to figure out this in advance, right? If you, take your if you take a single table and split it across multiple databases, which you have to do if your data store gets very, very large, 
how do you represent your key so you can figure out where to find the data? All right? Uh, and when you divide this data, how do you do it? This is a particularly interesting one because Twitter hit this problem. They had this great model where they would, uh, every day or couple days, they would add another database and all the traffic that happened that day would go to that new database and the other databases were just used for caching old data because most of the traffic is on new content. It's genius. Problem with that design is that every time you pull up a new one, that new one needs a lot of capability to handle the traffic. Right? So very, very expensive database. Then the next day, when you made that your backup server, because it's no longer interesting new content, you created a new one, you just have you have like this ten thousand dollar database you're using for backup and it's mostly idle. This is terribly inefficient. So eventually they had to change their model. They use more of a random ID approach. Okay. So this is the scary part. Um, what do you do when you need to change your schema? Because nobody's going to get their schema right. As soon as you have more load, you're going to realize there's some flaws in your design. How do you deal with it? Um, this is where SQL doesn't, as far as I can tell, have any good answers. You get to choose. Do you want to take down your server, shut everything off, or do you want to have a very complex upgrade logic? And I, it's going to depend on your circumstances. How bad is five minutes of downtime, okay? If you do need to move it, you're gonna end up with something that looks effectively like this flow. Pull up a new table that has everything perfect, migrate everything to it. This is all while everything's still running. Your API server's still up. Move everything into it, then switch your code, your API server, so it points at the new one, and then move in whatever the gap was, the data that was created while you were doing the first migration, and then delete your old data. That's really painful to get right. Okay. Uh, key value versus RDMS. Um, I like this comparison because functionally they're very similar, right? In Java, you compile everything. You know in advance how everything's going to work. It takes a long time to build. JavaScript, you just kind of pull it together. Everything's referenced by name, and you just hope it works at runtime. Um, <laughs> when you use key value storage, you end up with these big JSON blobs. And if you change your schema at different points, you're gonna end up with some very complex code to parse those JSON blobs because maybe this key wasn't ever stored or maybe you're in an upgrade situation and you're reading while in the middle of like updating the values. Uh, you go with the Java style, the RDMS style. You can't ever get in that situation because it's either fully working or fully broken, okay? That's compiled versus not compiled. There's no really perfect answer to this question. This is a design problem. So just ideologically, I think you can consider them in these two camps. All right, we use Redis, we use the key value store, we use the JavaScript-like approach. It works sometimes. Okay, this is stuff we haven't done, but it was a bunch of really good ideas that I saw from other people, and I am considering using stuff, approaches like this. Appro like this. These are, this one in particular is to try and address the issue with alter table. All right, so the scenario would be, I have a user table. It contains username, email address, Facebook token. And then one day I realize, oh, I should add support for Twitter. So let me add a Twitter token. Well, if I do an alter table on that and add a column for Twitter token, that means my database goes down for 10 minutes while it runs that. Alternatively, you can make it so that, as this design points out, every indexed key, so the Twitter token, is a table. So if I want to add a new index key, that just means create table. Create table doesn't block anything unless you're using it. So you can, add, you can modify your schema by adding new index keys very, very easily. Downside is you're going to end up having some serious effects on your joins and uh, other database operations. At this point, you really have to use it. You're using your MySQL or whatever database very similar to the way you would use a Redis, right? You're not going to do a join on it because it'd be terribly expensive. You'll primarily do select statements which select on a single key. And when you modify the data for any particular user, you end up with this fairly complicated transaction. Right, because you have to modify the store of the data and the key that's stored in a separate table at the same point. 
right? You can drop the begin commit transaction if you want, but then that makes it risky. So it's it's a choice. There's there's some reliability concerns if you don't do that. Uh, this is a good idea, and Frame Frame used it. Uh, they hit. I think they started using this approach right around 200 million users. So there's some real world examples, and that seems to be pretty compelling. All right. Um, this other approach is from Pinterest. It's pretty intelligent. Uh, they took the unique ID and made it so that in the unique ID for a given row, part of the contains which database to go to, shard. And the other part of the string is the UID that's local to that database. So you would have, when you wanted to find something, you're, you, go, you look at the key that you want, it tells you which database, and then you do a select for that one UID. The advantage is when you're scaling and you need to add support for another 10 million users, you just pull up a new database and that creates a new shard, that, that's a new shard and all the UIDs are new, all your existing data doesn't move. Right, so your scaling operation is create a new server. Right, nothing's rebalancing, That's which is the complex step that gets the people in trouble. Downside of this approach, um, like with many approaches, your foreign keys start breaking, and uh, join becomes really hard. So imagine you're trying to get the list of all of your friends, right? and your friend, your, these user tables are spread across three different shards. So how are you going to do that? You can, you can run a join on your friend list with the UUIDs, or more than likely you're going to do one select to get all the UUIDs, and then internally group by shard, and then run a bunch of in clauses. So that's a lot more complicated than a simple join. The, the reality is you're just going to end up dealing with these problems as you get to scale. Alright? Um, kind of fast, sorry. Um, let me see. Anyway, uh, actually it was going a lot faster than I was anticipating. Uh, we can go back and talk about this, but let's, let, let's jump into questions. I think it's more interesting. Okay. Thanks, Justin, for giving us real life examples. So we will, Roland. Uh, you mentioned Donovan today, but uh, I missed it. What was your reason for not going to use Donovan today? What was your, you know, I have nothing specific against DynamoDB. Um, we actually use Redis internally, which I believe performs very similar functions to DynamoDB. Uh, I think they're very, very equivalent. Um, I believe DynamoDB is actually a little bit more expensive than running an instance with Redis, but, but I don't know. I'd have to look at the cost. I don't have anything specifically against it. My concerns were primarily around um, scale. Uh, sorry, what happens during the scaling operations and how much do I trust it? So you earlier really commented that the place of things might have bought me I also wouldn't see myself as part of Amazon. They can probably use it to get the truth. Oh, no, I understand. That, no, that, no, that is true. That is true. You, you make a very good point about DynamoDB. Um, and I guess to, to, to back up your opinion, I would say we, we do use S3 and CloudFront, which which are big blob stores, and I do trust them. Um, honestly, I, get, I, I don't have a strong opinion about switching what we have currently in Redis over to DynamoDB. Uh, I would just do it based on cost at that point, since the, for, for our use case, they're functionally equivalent. Um, yeah, I don't know if Dynamo, yeah. I'd have to look and see if there's any cases where DynamoDB, there's any feature gap there. But I don't, in our current, Data store model, we couldn't take what's in SQL and move it to DynamoDB. That's the that's the follow table issue. It's very hard to, to represent that logic in like a key value store. Awesome. So, can I take you back to your Pinterest example? Yes. Um, my understanding is that it solves partially the problem of scaling. Yes. Does it uh, cope with schema changes at all? No. The Pinterest one is not a schema change solution at all. It's only to, to figure out how to handle the sharding issue. Any other questions? Joshua. Can you share more about your database uh, configuration? Like how many masters and slaves do you use? Right. Uh, 
Actually, it's very, very simple. It's a, we have a single read-write database. Um, we tried using read clones that didn't significantly improve performance versus uh, just putting a huge Redis cache over it. So it's a massive Redis cache and one database. It's, it turns out to be very efficient. Um, you, can't, you really cannot beat Redis for key value storage. Well, or DynamoDB would probably be similar performance characteristics. Yeah. Any other questions? Just now, a lot of people like put up your hand, and there were a lot of database names. So, I mean, Justin is uh, has lo worked a lot with uh, databases or even emerging technologies. So, get this chance and ask him questions. And he has been dealing with challenges. Yes. yes. Uh, since yours seems like a total social network, have you considered draft databases? Right. Um, yes, we have looked into them. Uh, we have. We've never done a sample implementation in one. So I can't speak from direct experiences. Um, I know for a fact Twitter's based on, well, for their follow tables, they use SQL. So that's a good point for SQL. Uh, I believe Facebook, Facebook I have to look into. I'm not sure what they're using. Uh, I'm not, not sure which social networks that are large scale have actually used one of the graph ones. But FlockDB is a layer on top of SQL, right? It, it's still fundamentally like SQL, SQL infrastructure. I'm sorry, it's really hard to hear. Can you? FlockDB is based on the file system. SQL is used for backups. Okay, I see what you're saying. I thought FlockDB was the component that would redirect based on the ID to the appropriate database. It was the redirector. <coughs> Yes. When I started my startup and if you want to get no there were a lot of things, the whole no is here. One of the thoughts that came in the head was, if you were a one of the most popular software jobs today, Yes. Yes. Internally at the company, about ev once every week, there's uh, somebody raising the point we should switch something to MongoDB. So, yeah, we, we do face that often. And um, I'm definitely not ruling out at some point in the future that we would consider that sort of change. I would say the point when I'd consider it is probably when somebody I already trust, like AWS, had MongoDB as another option equivalent to RDS. So when it, it achieved that level of scale and there were substantial deployments on it. Um, yeah, you can't, you can't get too religious about these decisions. Uh, either way, you, you know, being pro NoSQL or anti NoSQL. So yeah, I could see changing it. But for, for something where it's your data storage, my bar is pretty high of making that change. Oh, over here. Hi, uh, Alex from Rocket Internet. Um, so, kind of piggybacking off of his question, I'm wondering, how do you guys make decisions on using kind of new, sexy, emerging technologies versus older technologies that have been established and maybe used it? Right. Um, a, a good example with other companies. Right. Okay. Well, one we changed recently uh, is we we were originally based. Did I lose my mic? Yes, I did. So, since. The, since the question is generically about technology decisions and not about databases, I'll reference a non-database example. Uh, we were originally based, uh, our web server and our API server were based on Jetty, so it's Java. Uh, we were, we're hitting some serious scale issues with that, we we're looking for alternatives, and then we did end up switching to play with Scala, and that was a massive technology shift. Um, the, what, 
way we did it was we just take, took a few simple examples of core functions like getting the feed, built it, and then load tested it and compared it against what we had already and looked at what it would take to actually move that one. And it was crushing it, so it was a pretty easy call. And then you just build out the rest of the detailed things, right? Like changing the settings and all these other, they were very time consuming. Um, in that case, it was pretty simple. It was like, can it handle load? What's the performance? Very easy to evaluate. Uh, with a store, I'm, that's, we get very nervous is, how do you tell whether or not it's going to survive all of your scaling needs in advance without losing data? It's a lot harder problem to prove. So that one, I'm setting the bar bas basically on other people's experience. And that's why I said, like, if AWS has MongoDB, then I'm, I'm gonna strongly consider it. Um, yeah, but with the API server, web server, those are a lot easier to switch. Right. Uh, at the moment, we only use Redis for read. Uh, the the the, the operation is very simple. Anytime data is modified, delete entry in Redis. Anytime you try and read data, go to Redis. If it doesn't exist, get from database, put in Redis. So it's a it's an on-demand read cache. Very simple. Uh, we can we will get performance gains if we also cache on the writes, but that makes it easy to get in a situation where the caches are inconsistent. <laughs> they, they, where your cache is inconsistent with your database. Yeah, yeah. So it's going with the simple truth is in the database model. Right? So anything changes, delete, go get from database. So how do you avoid the network agencies or I O operations when you're doing a write operation on your that's more expensive than the data. It is a lot more expensive. Um, our particular social network, if you look at consumers versus um, producers, we're about 100 to 1. So the write time is less important than the read time. So in our particular situation, I think if you're looking at a Facebook model, it would be very different. So we haven't hit that problem. Josh, thank you. Do you do any partition? How do you do any partition? Right, uh, so yes and no. We have a root database that contains all 30 million users. It's not that expensive if you're looking at an M1 extra large, okay? But we also have copies of the user database that run in all these telco infrastructures and those are partitioned based on users that are actually in those telecom networks. So it is partitioned, it's partitioned by region. Uh, and those are full copies of the user data. So, because you can't, the, the, the latency to go from an operator in India up to AWS is too high. You have to have local data. And that's a, that's a read-write sync. Great, any uh, last questions for Justin or Ashish? Yeah, I have a if not really, this is not the last chance to ask him. He'll be around asking questions. But more importantly, uh, Bubbly also, Bubble Motion also yes. holds uh, Tech Talks monthly. Can we have a little bit of that from you? A little bit about the Tech Talks? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what our next topic is. Um, a wish, is Wish here? No. Uh, those are announced. If, you, if you're interested, the best thing to do, just email me. It's pretty easy, justin at bubbly.net. You can remember that, hopefully. Um, and we'll, we'll put you on the mailing list for it. Uh, it's monthly, it's in our office. We're in the old red dot traffic, which is the traffic, old traffic police. We're in the jail cell. It's kind of cool. We've got so bars it's in meetup.com as well? Yes. Yeah, Bubbly Tech Talks. So meetup.com, Bubbly Tech Talks. You will meet Justin, you will meet the engineers of uh, uh, Bubble Motion and- uh, Yeah, I'm not doing, I don't think I'm on the schedule for quite a while for the <laughs> Tech Talks. I think uh, we're trying to do some on like iOS animations and Android, very client focused. So those could be very interesting. Yeah, for very diverse uh, topics, uh, Bubbly Tech Talks. So yeah, there are a lot of startups in Singapore who also hold Tech Talks like Bubble Motion, generously sharing their challenges every single time. So go ahead and join them. So Justin Mann, huge uh, thank you. Thank you.